everyone, it's Audrey Moore here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. We are so excited to have you here as we kick off our newest mission for the month of August through mission conservation, sharks. Throughout the month of August, you will get to meet multiple partners to learn all about sharks. Get ready to dive into these fun facts about these amazing animals. In order to play this really fun mission, all you have to do is swim on over to our mission conservation page at wondersofwildlife.org slash mission conservation. That, that will bring you to our mission conservation webpage. On this website, I will bring your attention down to the Get the App. Once you click download, that will take you to download the Agents of Discovery app, which you will need to play any mission conservation mission. Once you have that app downloaded, create a user account and log in. Hit the search bar and type in mission conservation. This is where all of our at home missions will pop up for you to play. Once you have the mission popped up and loaded, hit play and get ready for your fun adventure. If you are looking for more shark related activities, we are going to direct you down to another part of the website where it says schedule of mission and activities. This tab will show you all of the missions we have live, including our current mission, sharks. Under this tab, you will also find our activity guide that we have specifically made for you at home. There will be a craft, an awesome outdoor activity, and something that you can do to promote conservation for sharks and their importance to our ecosystems. So I'm currently standing here in front of our Shark Alley exhibit here at Wonders of Wildlife, and it is home to our collection of shark jaws. There are over 50 species represented in this room, including the Megalodon shark. Did you know that this giant shark lived approximately 23 to 3.6 million years ago? It was the biggest shark in the world and one of the largest fish to have ever exist. This big shark is a close relative to a shark that we have in our oceans today, the white shark. It is believed to have been able to reach 10 to 18 meters in length. That's about 30 to 60 feet. This behind me is our replica of the Megalodon shark jaw. Today, we are going to learn about why sharks are so important to our ecosystems and why they may not be as scary as we think they are. We have Dean Fessler, also known as the Shark Man, from the Shark Research Institute in New Jersey. Dr. Fessler, how are you doing today? Dr. Fessler? I'm very well, how are you? I'm doing great. What do you have for us today? Well, after your lovely introduction, my name is Dean Fessler of the Shark Research Institute. We are based in Princeton, New Jersey. And Princeton, New Jersey, believe it or not, has quite a history for shark research. Now, if you're as old as I am, I won't give you the exact number, but I was born in 1960, so I'll let you do the math. So in 1970, the shark research really started to take off here in New Jersey because a little known film called Blue Water, White Death was produced. And it was the first documentary that attempted to actually capture the white shark on film. And I was so happy to hear during the introduction that the white shark was referred to as the white shark instead of what most people say, the great white shark. Because did you know that there really is no such thing as a great white shark? But I'll get back to that in a little bit. She mentioned that they had over 50 jaws representing 50 different species of sharks. Well, let me give you another little piece of information. How many species of sharks do you think there are in our world's oceans? People really don't realize how many there are. Now just think about it for a minute. 100, 200. The truth is with the deep diving submersible technologies that we now have, we're able to reach parts of the oceans that we never were able to reach before. And we're discovering new shark species. So currently, let me backtrack. 
when I was in college, way back in the 70s, way back then, before there was even the internet and we had to use textbooks and libraries, there were about 350 to 375 species of sharks listed. So that was a long list of names you had to memorize when you were in school. Well, now, some 40 some years later, we've identified over 500 species of shark. So whether you love them like I do, you're scared of them because of the media representation of them as man-eating monsters, or if you're somewhere in the middle, if there are that many species of animal within an ecosystem, they're clearly there for a reason. And there are sharks in all of our world's oceans. And I like to put it simply, think of them as your local garbage men, or do any of your kids out there take out the recycling for your mom and dad? Um, sharks are basically doing that job in the oceans to keep the oceans clean, to keep the oceans healthy. They get rid of and feed upon fish and other species of animal that are injured or are unable to escape the shark during a predation event, or they take care of animals that are overpopulating a certain area. So there's basically enough food for everyone. So there's sharks in deep water, there's sharks in shallow water, there's sharks in warm water, there's sharks in cold water. And I've had the opportunity to study them for over 50 years now. And believe it or not, there's still quite a bit of information, even general biological information about sharks that we're still learning and we need to learn in order to preserve them for the future. Because like I said before, depending on your opinion of them, they are critical in keeping the oceans as a whole healthy. And even though they call it planet Earth, it's still mostly water and it's still mostly salt water. So the ocean is a critical component in not only keeping sharks around, but keeping you and me around. Now, I know we don't have an entire uh, month long semester here to discuss shark biology, but I wanted to touch not only on my favorite, but on the one that was mentioned earlier as being the largest shark that we have known in existence and one that a lot of people are fascinated by. And there was even a recent movie called The Meg, which was short for Megalodon. Some people say Megalodon. And again, it was the largest known predatory fish that we currently are aware of. And you saw the jaws in the background, but I actually have an individual tooth here with me to give you a little personal scale. Now look at the size of this one tooth. Let me turn it sideways so you can see how thick and chunky it is. And the flip side. Now here's my hand. I'm six feet two. And this one tooth is almost as big as my hand. Now, most sharks have approximately 250 teeth inside their jaws. And this one tooth weighs about two pounds. So do a little quick math, two times 250, 500 pounds of just teeth in your mouth. So imagine how big the rest of your body would have to be to swim around with 500 pounds of these inside your mouth. We believe that one of the reasons they were so big is that the food they were eating, these sharks were swimming around in our oceans when dinosaurs were still walking around on the land. So if a brontosaurus fell into the water and got swept down into the depths, you would need a pretty big set of teeth to have a brontosaurus for lunch. And that's another reason we believe these teeth are so thick. It's almost two inches thick. They had to be strong enough to penetrate into very thick layers of muscle. And we even find these teeth embedded in bone. 
So we know they were very serious tools. Now, let me compare this one with the shark that most people think about today, the white shark or the infamous non-existent great white shark. Now look at this tooth, a little smaller, huh? Now this is about from a five or six foot long white shark. They certainly do get much bigger, but it's fully formed. It's completely serrated. By that, I mean, it has little edges like a steak knife. And that's how sharks feed. They use the bottom row of teeth first, like a fork, and they come in and grab a hold of what they're trying to eat. Just like you put your fork on your dinner to keep it from sliding off the plate. The shark uses the bottom row of teeth to grab its prey or its lunch or dinner. And then the upper row of teeth come down like your knife, cut out a piece of meat and push it right back down the shark's throat. They don't chew their food. They just take a nice chunk, they wiggle their head to get it in the right position and swallow it down. Now that's one of the things that makes sharks so endangered today is that when they eat something, their digestion takes a very, very long time. It can stay within their system for weeks before it's fully processed. And that's another problem we're facing in today's oceans is pollution. So if you have an animal that has a slow digestion process, whatever it eats is going to stay in its body for a very long time. So if a shark eats something that is contaminated with chemicals, eventually those chemicals are gonna get into the shark's body. And if you eat that shark, you're eating those chemicals as well. And that's the biggest threat sharks are facing right now is overfishing. Fishermen are catching more sharks than the mommy sharks are putting back into the water. Look at this one photograph. It might be a little hard to see, but these are piles and piles of shark fins from a single day of shark fishing in Taiwan. Now, sadly, what they'll do is they'll catch the shark, they'll cut the fins off, and then they'll throw the rest of the shark's body back into the ocean. And it's a really horrific, painful process. And I don't wanna to get too graphic or upset anybody, but imagine having your arm or leg removed and then being thrown back outside. You know, and that's what these poor sharks are going through. And millions and millions of them are being caught every year. And there's some animals that have reached populations reduced down to 90% from the numbers we used to have available to us. So it's becoming harder and harder to find animals to even study that have reached maturity so we can learn more about their life cycle because many sharks, we don't even know where they reproduce, how often they reproduce, where they gather in groups, whether they stay singular animals. And that's why we need biologists and researchers in the future who are hopefully watching right now to pick up where the original shark scientists have kind of started. Shark research is a fairly new science. People were afraid of sharks. They thought they were too dangerous to get close enough to actually study like other animals. And specifically one shark in particular became the star of a movie and scared the heck out of a lot of people, but also generated a whole new generation of shark scientists. Now I'm sure you can guess the name of that movie and book. It's called Jaws, yes. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I really had no choice but to become a shark scientist because I grew up in the same area that the author of Jaws lived. And on top of that, his best friend, the cameraman for the movie Jaws lived a mile away. So basically my entire life I was influenced 
by the impact these animals have both on me personally and our entire community. And then when that movie came out, the entire world. And okay, which shark are we talking about now? The famous quote unquote, great white shark. Okay. Now look at this picture. There's so many things I could talk about, but again, I know we don't have time, but let me start here. First of all, most of the white shark is not even white. Only its underbelly is actually white. The rest of it is typically a steel gray in color. So how did it get its name, the white shark? Well, way back in the 1700s, when shark populations were very healthy, there were large animals and quite a few of them. Occasionally, a fisherman would catch them. But back then, the fishing technology was very, very antiquated compared to what do we have today. You know, they didn't even have motors. So imagine being out on a rowboat trying to catch a 20-foot fish that weighs 5,000 pounds. So what they would do if they were successful in catching it, they would bring it back to the beach. They would have to roll it on its back to pull it onto the land because it was so heavy. And in doing so, it exposed the white underbelly. So people would look at this animal and say, my gosh, look at that great white shark. And believe it or not, the name stuck. So for hundreds of years, this animal has been called the great white shark. So why earlier did I say there's no such thing as a great white shark? Again, I could spend an entire PhD dissertation explaining that question, but let me put it simply. There's a large man-made structure in China. That's the largest representation of such a structure in the world. It's called the Great Wall, okay? There are several species of hammerhead shark. The largest hammerhead shark is called the great hammerhead. There are several species of barracuda swimming in our oceans. The largest member, guess what it's called? The great barracuda, okay? There's currently only one species alive that we know of, of white shark today, Carcharodon carcareus, which in English, is the jagged tooth flesh eater. So in order for there to be a great white shark, there has to be a lesser or smaller white shark. And there isn't. So if you really want to be accurate and scientists thrive on accurate, correct data, the great white shark technically does not exist. So that's a long story made very short. But I will tell you firsthand that it truly is a great animal. Did you notice anything else in this picture? Specifically an absence of bars as in a shark cage? Yes, I've actually swam and researched and studied these animals outside of a cage to demonstrate that they're not the man any monster that the movies and media have made them out to be. And yes, I still have all my fingers and all my toes, and I have never had a scratch from a shark encounter. Now, seasickness, that's a whole other story, but any injuries from the shark has never happened. And it was my work with them in South Africa in the late 1999. Hey, Dean, are you still there? Looks like you're frozen. Dr. Fessler? All right, well, it looks like Dr. Fessler is having some technical difficulties. So um, while we try to get him back on the live stream, I will go ahead and talk about a few artifacts that I have here. Um, so we have some shark eggs. And when 
Sharks are in the wild. They have three different kinds of ways that they can give birth. There's oviparous, which means they can lay eggs kind of like a chicken or a bird. Um, there's viviparous, which means they have live birth. Or there's ovoviviparous, where they lay the eggs inside the body, the babies grow and hatch with inside the mother, and then they are um, delivered as live birth. So I've got some eggs here. So these are oviparous. And we have a couple different shapes. So we have a here, and it looks like Dr. Fessler is hopping back on, uh, but this is a corkscrew. And that would come from a horn shark, which is a smaller species of shark, or we have a mermaid's purse here. Um, and they're called that because they have a bunch of little strings that they can attach to things like seaweed to keep those eggs um, attached so that they can continue to grow until they're ready to burst them uh, out of, burst themselves out of the egg. All right, Dr. Fessler, can you hear us? Yes, I don't know what happened there. Perfect, no worries. You can continue on. I just wanted to kind of finish up with some behavior and interaction with the white shark that sort of has rewritten the textbook about what we knew about this animal or what we assumed about the behavior of this animal. And it's research that continues to go on today and is featured in all of the documentary programs now, like Discovery Channel, Shark Week, and that Geo, um, Sharks Gone Wild, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a complete contradiction to these animals being mindless man-eating machines. Okay, what am I talking about? Look at this image here. Imagine you're on the back of a 17-foot boat and a 17-foot white shark comes up to the back of your motor. Okay, yes, that's my hand. So it's still here. Now, notice she has got her mouth completely agape and I am keeping her from making contact with my outboard motor with one finger. I am just pushing her away like a bad dog with a newspaper. Bad shark, get away from my boat. Now, I can guarantee you if this 17 foot, 3,500 pound female wanted to get a hold of my hand or that motor, I wouldn't be standing or actually sitting in front of you today describing what's going on. But all she did was lift her head and mouth all of, out of the water. She was coming over the, to the motor to see if it was something edible. But when she realized it wasn't, she backed off and I reached over just to make sure she didn't bump into the motor because the motor can actually do damage, cut the inside of her mouth or break her teeth. And then she can't feed. So we're doing everything we can to protect her here. We're frozen again. Yeah. So we continued to push that envelope with these animals coming up to engage our boat. And this is when things really started to change. Look here. We've actually got this white shark by the snout, and we are walking her around the perimeter of the boat by the nose. We've got complete contact with her and she is not aggressive. She's not trying to bite us. And if you look very carefully, her teeth are recessed. And by that, I mean, they're pulled back. Do any of you out there have a cat? Do you know how they can pull their claws inside of their paw? Well, the white shark can basically do the same thing with its upper row of teeth because they're suspended on basically a hinge and she can pull them up 
if she doesn't want to use them and she's worried about breaking them, or she can shoot them out at the last minute just to get an extra inch to get close enough to whatever it is she's trying to grab a hold of. So what we learned was, is if they approach us with their teeth pulled back, they're not interested in trying to bite anything. They're just trying to figure out what that thing is that's got a hold of me by the nose. And if you learn about shark biology, one of their primary sensory systems or their ability to examine an area that they're in is located at the end of their snout or their nose. There's small little holes that have like a jelly inside. And the scientific name is the ampullae of Lorenzini. But it basically is like a jello and it picks up electrical signals. And if enough signal is present, it starts to wiggle that jelly inside the nose. And it sends a signal to the little shark's brain that, hey, there might be something alive and maybe you could get something to eat. So you should check it out. But we found if we made contact in that area, and basically overloaded the sensory system, the shark would switch from predatory mode to curiosity mode and just try and figure out what the heck is going on. Because these animals spend their whole life chasing things. It's very rare for something to turn around and chase it and try and make contact where those teeth are located. So it confuses the shark, basically. A large shark does not have a very large brain. Um, so this is part of the things that lead to the research that needs to be done to understand their whole biological impact and priority and role within the oceanic systems better in the future so we can do more to protect them. And that's what our institute, the Shark Research Institute, which the website is www.sharks.org, is intending to do. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. All righty, Dr. Fessler. And it looks like we actually do have one question, if you wouldn't mind answering it for us from one of our viewers. I will try. All righty. So they asked, why did the Taiwanese people cut off the fins and do they use them for something? Dr. Fessler, can you hear us? All right. Well, we will just have to um, Call it a day, that is all the time that we have for the day. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dean. It was a pleasure to have you here and to talk about these magnificent creatures. Be sure to join us next week as we continue to talk about our mission for the month of August, sharks. Throughout August, we will get to learn super exciting facts about these apex predators. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next week.